Good day. I'm Dr Corns from England and I'm interested in how we optimise supportive care during active cancer treatment at this challenging time with pandemic COVID-19 infection. COVID is of critical importance to public health. There's no doubt about that. But then, so also is cancer. Because cancer is the world's most serious disease. Around 25,000 patients die each day of it worldwide. And in a country like Britain, that will translate to a 1,000 or more patients diagnosed each day with a serious invasive cancer that will need some form of treatment. Now, there's no doubt that if we continue to treat them, there will be complications of active cancer treatment. But against that, if we stop or under-treat, we will also see complications of cancer progression, which tells us we have to rethink our treatment choices in the circumstances we face today. The balance of treatment decisions are driven by our lack of hospital resources and the knowledge that when patients come to our clinics and hospitals and meet healthcare professionals, that they face increased infection risks. We know that because of our colleagues in China, who've shown increased risks both for cancer patients on treatment and in remission. With increased risks of hospital admission, of complicated admissions requiring ventilation, and sadly true too of, of death as well. Now, one of the most feared complications of active cancer treatment is neutropenic sepsis. It's common. It affects around 60,000 patients every year in the United States, and it has a serious consequence too, because one in 14 of those patients dies. There's a second problem, that those admissions and complications delay the next cycle of chemotherapy or force dose reductions on us, and when the relative dose intensity of chemotherapy falls by more than 15%, we know the chance of cancer cure falls too. And even with the development of white cell growth factors, filgrastims, we know that the problem still remains common today. A survey suggested between 7 and 22% of our patients on treatment would need admission. Now, myelosuppression by chemotherapy causes problems in several ways. The first is infection itself. When the body's immune defences are lowered through neutropenia, trivial infections can spread in the bloodstream as septicemia and infect vital organs. Because it's such a medical emergency, we don't wait to find the origin of infection, but we offer broad-spectrum intravenous antibiotics at diagnosis. And that increases antibiotic resistance within our hospitals. And then thirdly, the presence of infection and neutropenia forces dose delays and reductions that will affect patients in the future. In 2020, there's a fourth complication that's been pointed out by our colleagues at the United Kingdom Institute, National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, DICE. And they tell us that there is a real difficulty in distinguishing the symptoms of COVID-19 infection with neutropenic sepsis from chemotherapy. So if we're to be offering cancer chemotherapy at this time, we need to think what will we do to prevent febrile neutropenia. And the first thing to say is we know that the risk of this problem is greatest with the first cycle of chemotherapy. In fact, typically more than half the risk goes with cycle one. And this explains why primary prophylaxis with white cell growth factors is so important. The guidelines for what to do are similar worldwide, but here in Europe we'll follow those of the European Society of Medical Oncology. And all guidelines start by recommending that we assess each patient for their individual risk factors. We base that assessment on the patient fitness, their frailty, and the number of other illnesses they have, their comorbidity. And if we believe that the subsequent risk of febrile neutropenia is high, 20% or greater, we would normally offer primary prophylaxis with a white cell growth factor. If we believe the risk was low, 
then we would hold those drugs in reserve. Now, whether you read guidelines from Europe, America or Britain's NICE, they all concur. Used on label, you could choose equally between short-acting daily dose filgrastim or long-acting single dose per cycle peg filgrastim. And you could expect equally useful outcomes between originator or biosimilar brands. The choice of growth factor from those guidelines was driven by science, because the best science was head-to-head -head randomized trials. And it's clear from a paper that we wrote in 2018 that dosed by label, there are no differences in the rate of febrile neutropenia whether you choose to give daily dose filgrastim or single dose peg filgrastim. But what our paper showed was that in the real world, there was a difference. Pretty much every study suggested a clinically meaningful difference in favour of treating patients' primary prophylaxis with peg filgrastim over the short-acting daily dose drugs. And it's always interesting to work out why. We followed up our study by a survey of practice across many clinics in Europe in 2019. And we discovered that patients were often given less than the recommended doses and schedules within the label filed by the European medicines regulators. They received sub-label doses and schedules. So for example, in our survey, only half the patients received weight-based dosing, and only one third were prescribed seven days or more filgrastim for cycle one. Now, it's not a problem unique to Europe because other surveys have uh, seen similar problems in Europe uh, before and in the United States as well. The science behind the problem is clear. With each cycle of cytotoxic chemotherapy, the blood count will fall and reaches its low point, its nadir, somewhere around 7 to 14 days after the treatment's given, and then will recover in most patients, enabling us to retreat in around 21 days per chemotherapy cycle. Now, what we need to do is to support the neutrophil count through the time of the low period, the nadir, and we can do it in two ways. We can give daily dose filgrastim, and the labelled dosing is typically somewhere between 7 and 14 days of daily dosing, or we could give a single dose of long-acting peg filgrastim, which maintains a clinical effect through the nadir, as shown by head-to-head -head studies. Now, the largest study of real-world practice comes from Dr. Riker and colleagues in the United States of America. And by pooling two large insurance databases, they could track more than 100,000 patients having chemotherapy for cancer or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, of which around 5,500 received daily dose filgrastim as their prophylaxis. Now with that data, the first thing to show was that the majority of patients, like in our survey, received doses and schedules less than those recommended in the label for the drug, such that only 16% of people got seven days or more primary prophylaxis. And Riker's team showed that had a consequence. Because once you had less than seven days dosing, you doubled or higher your risk of being admitted with febrile neutropenia. And even more worryingly, your risk of death rose in a dose-dependent manner. And that to me suggests that we could improve the outcomes for patients going through cytotoxic cancer chemotherapy by optimally dosing daily dose filgrastim or long-acting peg filgrastim. So the decision today, which filgrastim formulation to choose, short or long-acting, is driven by now a good scientific knowledge. We know that dosed by label, as in the randomized trials, we get equivalent outcomes, but in the real world, less. And so in the future, whatever version we choose, remember there are two aims of our treatment. One, that it has to be effective, and two, that we need to minimise contact between healthcare professionals, HCPs, and our patients to avoid the risk of transmitting COVID infections. So, we need to match 
doses and schedules from the labels for the drugs, but we also need to remember that we need high-quality patient-friendly injection devices to improve compliance and minimise the risk that we will need to call patients back to clinic or send district nurses out to administer missed doses. Fortunately, the European approval of biosimilar versions of pegfilgrestin only recently has made optimal treatment selection even more affordable. So, thinking of the 2020 decision about what to choose, remember that it is difficult to distinguish between COVID-19 infections and neutropenic sepsis when you first meet a patient who is unwell on cancer treatment. As a consequence, the UK National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, recommends that we use all our treatment powers to minimise immunosuppression during these treatment times. And our survey suggests one way of minimising the problem would be to pay attention to giving the labelled doses of our drugs or considering the use of single-dose long-acting pegfilgrastim to reduce patient risk at this challenging time. So I'll leave you with six conclusions. Pandemic COVID-19 is important and will disrupt healthcare, not just now, but for many months or even years longer. During that time, cancer will still need treatment. One of the greatest risks of cancer chemotherapy at any time is neutropenic sepsis. Surveys in both Europe and America suggest widespread underdosing of daily filgrastin, which tells us that optimal dosing of filgrastin or switching our, our uh, stock to peg filgrastin should improve the patient experience at this time. And optimal drug choice of doses, schedules and formulation is made easier today by the approval of biosimilars, drugs that have no clinically meaningful differences from the originator medicine. Thank you so much for giving up your time and keep safe during this challenging period. Goodbye.